For this lab, you need the following. Two servos, two standoffs, four 632 machine screws, one servo body bracket, one angle bracket, six 256 machine screws, one paper clip, two 440 machine screws, two 440 hex nuts. We're going to start here by drawing the kinematic diagram of a spherical wrist. If we start by drawing the kinematic diagram, then we can use the diagram to build the physical device. So a spherical wrist consists of three revolute joints, as I'm drawing here. Each of them has its axis of rotation perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the joint that comes before it. I'll draw in the x, y, z axes here for each joint. Remember that the z axis is the axis of rotation. And x and y have to be set so that the whole frame follows the right hand rule. And I also need to have a coordinate frame on the end effector. And I'll just make this coordinate frame match the frame before it. Now, it's time to start to build the spherical wrist. I am going to walk you through how to build the spherical wrist, but before we do that, I'd like you to try and build it on your own from the kinematic diagram. The reason that I want you to try to build it on your own before looking at my solution is that it's a good learning experience to try to build something just from the kinematic diagram. It forces you to think about axes of rotation and which axes are perpendicular to which other axes. If you become good at this, you can design your robotic device first as a kinematic diagram and then build it later on. If you'd like, one thing that you could do would be to have one member of your group watch the video to see how the spherical wrist is built and then that person can give hints or assistance to the others who are building it as you go and can confirm or deny whether they're doing the right thing. Once you think you've built it on your own, go ahead and watch what I did to build it and see if your design matches my design. So here the first thing I'm going to do is place these standoffs on the board. So I'm going to pass one 632 screw through the board in each of two holes. And I'm going to pick the two holes that are diagonal across from each other in order to give our base uh, first servo a little more stability. So once I've placed these two uh, 632 standoffs on the board, I can place this servo here and I'll use the other two 632 screws and I'll use a screwdriver to screw them down. So now I have one servo with its axis of rotation vertical coming out of the board. My next axis of rotation needs to be perpendicular to this one. So I'm going to take this servo body bracket. I'm going to use two of the 256 screws to attach this body bracket to the horn of the first servo. Now there are four holes here for 256 screws and four holes that are tapped in the servo horn, but you really only need two in order to hold this bracket down securely. 
So to save time, we're only going to use two screws. I'll put both of the screws in loosely and then tighten them both up. Then I'll take this other servo here and attach it to the body bracket using the 440 screws and nuts. So by laying this servo on its side, I achieve what we need of having the axis of rotation of the second servo being perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the first servo. And you'll notice the way I lined this up was to have the horn of the second servo line up with the horn of the first servo so that if we would draw the axes of rotation through both of these servos, the two axes of rotation would actually intersect each other. So now I'm going to take this angle bracket and if I freeze this picture here, you'll notice that this side of the angle bracket is actually shorter than the other side of the angle bracket. And it's important how you attach this angle bracket in order to make this work. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and take the short end and attach the short end to my third servo. And once again, I'll use two of these little 256 screws to attach the short end to the horn of the third servo. So you'll notice that the long end is the end that's sticking up here. The reason we're going to do that is so that when we attach it to the second servo, we'll have a little bit more room to be able to turn this second servo before it actually collides with itself. So now I'm going to take the other end of this angle bracket and I'm going to take my last two 256 screws and use them to attach the third servo with the angle bracket like this. So in this picture this is the long end of the angle bracket and this is the short end over here. I'll put both of the screws in loosely and then tighten them up. So here we go, we have the final device and we're just going to check its range of motion. I want to make sure that this third servo can move Once we get it built, we're going to draw in the base frame. I'll put my x-axis here and my y-axis here. The base frame is always the frame that is attached to the ground, attached to the thing that's not moving. So we can draw it on our board. Now I'm going to check the range of motion of these servos one more time. I want to set each of these servos so that it's roughly in the middle of its complete range of motion. So here my first servo, I'm going to move it to the far clockwise and far counterclockwise points and then I'm going to turn it back about 90 degrees so that it's in the middle of its range right there. And I'm going to do the same with the next servo. Try and put it roughly in the middle. It doesn't have to be exact. And then for the third servo, I'm going to check its range of motion, find the two stops, and then put it right in the middle. Now I'm going to show you next how to make a coordinate frame out of a paper clip. We're going to use this as a reference for the uh, third frame in our spherical wrist. So take your paper clip and the first thing you're going to do is bend out this inner part of the paper clip. So I'm going to press that inner part out 
and bend it down at a 90 degree angle to the rest of the paper clip. Just like that, so it's about 90 degrees. Next, we're going to take this part right there and bend it out so it's straight. This will just make this axis in our coordinate frame a little bit longer. And now we're going to use the remaining part of this paper clip down here as our third axis. They won't all be starting at zero. We're just using this to see the directions of X, Y, and Z. So here we have a little device that has three perpendicular lines to it. We're going to use that as our coordinate frame. So take your paper clip bent into a coordinate frame and put it into this kind of a configuration here. And we're going to tape it to the third servo. Just tape it right down. And now we're going to label each of the axes. So I'm going to write X3 on this piece of tape here. And then I'm going to attach this piece of tape to this paperclip axis so that X3 right now is in the same direction that we drew X0 on the board. So that direction is going to be X3. And now I'm going to take another piece of tape and here I'm going to write Y3 on the piece of tape. Y3. And I'm going to tape that to the part of the paper clip that right now is pointed in the same direction as Y0. So if I move the camera here a little bit, I put this Y3 in the same direction as Y0. And then I'll take my last piece of tape and I'll write in Z3. And we'll tape that to the direction that's remaining. I'll move my camera again here so you can see this. There we go. Z3 is attached to this part of the paper clip that's sticking up. So right now X, Y, and Z3 are all in the same directions as X, Y, and Z0. So the zero frame is attached to the board and the three frame is attached to servo number three. So let's take a look at the rotation matrices that we have. Right now, in the configuration that the frames are in, the rotation between zero and three will be uh, a matrix that we can figure out by using our shortcut method where we write new axes, that is frame three and the columns, and old axes, that is frame zero and the rows. So new X is in the same direction as old X, new Y is in the same direction as old Y, and new Z is in the same direction as old Z. So our rotation matrix is just the identity matrix right now. So now let's suppose that we have a rotation of one of these three servos. And let's start with theta one. Let's suppose theta one is rotated to 90 degrees. What would be our rotation matrix in this case? Let's figure it out by using our actual spherical wrist. Take servo one and rotate it 90 degrees. Now let's figure out our rotation matrix by looking at a, the comparison between the three frame and the zero frame. Now I'm about to write the answer here in this matrix. See if you can figure out what the matrix is before I write it. So pause the video and see if you can figure out what this matrix should be. So we're going to start out by looking at the direction of the new three axis. 
the new x-axis, that is x3, is in the same direction as y0. The y3 axis is in the opposite direction as x0, and z3 is in the same direction as z0. So our rotation matrix should look like this. Now let's make another supposition. Let's suppose that in addition to theta1 being 90 degrees, theta2 is also 90 degrees. Let's go and do this on our actual spherical wrist. We'll move theta 2 down 90 degrees. Now, I'm about to fill in this matrix, but you try and fill in the matrix on your own first by comparing the two frames. Now, for our last example here, let's suppose that theta 3 is also 90 degrees. I'm going to go rotate theta 3 90 degrees. Now, pause the video and see if you can write this rotation matrix. Now let's look back at our kinematic diagram. We're going to try and write the rotation matrix from 0 to 3, and we're going to see if what we calculated using the physical device agrees with our equations. I'm going to draw in first the positive direction of each of these thetas, defined by the direction of the z-axis. Now, let's write these rotation matrices. The rotation from 0 to 1 will start with a rotation around z of theta 1. Then we have to write the part of the matrix that accounts for the difference in orientation between these two frames. I'm going to multiply these together right away. Next, we're going to find the rotation from 1 to 2. See if you can do this on your own, and then check your answer against what I do.
Try to do this multiplication also to make sure that you remember how to multiply matrices. The rotation from 2 to 3 is a little bit easier than the other ones because we only have the matrix accounting for theta 3 and we do not have any matrix accounting for the difference in orientation between these frames because frames 2 and 3 have the same orientation. Another way of saying this is that the identity matrix is the matrix that accounts for the difference in orientation. So when I multiply these matrices together, my result should be the same as this matrix that was multiplied by the identity matrix. Now we could go through the work here of multiplying together the three rotation matrices to get a rotation matrix that goes all the way from frame 0 to frame 3. Instead, open up MATLAB. We're going to write some code to multiply these matrices together after plugging in some values of rotations for theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. We'll use this code to first check what we did by comparing it to what we saw with the physical spherical manipulator. So the first thing we're going to do is set up our MATLAB so that we have one window that is a script where we can write code. You can tell this is a script window because there's a line number here. And we also want to be able to see our command window, which you can identify with these two little arrows, so that we can see the output. In our code, we're going to start by setting up our variable. We're going to have a variable theta1, theta2, and theta 3 and we'll start out by send, setting these variables to 0. Now we'll type in our matrix R01. We're going to use the function cos d and sine d because we're going to give our theta angles in degrees instead of radians. If we just used cos and sine, then they, it would be expecting the angles to be in radians. We're going to type in the rotation matrix from 1 to 2 also. And finally, the rotation from 2 to 3. Notice I'm putting a semicolon at the end of each of these matrices. I'm doing that so that when we run this code, we won't see each of the individual matrices printed out to the command window. I just want to see the final result, the rotation from 0 all the way to 3, printed out to the command window. So each of these will have a semicolon at the end of the matrix. Now, to get the complete rotation from 0 to 3, all I have to do is multiply each of these matrices together. And this one, I will not put a semicolon at the end of the line because when I run it, I want the, to see the output. So we'll click Run. I'm going to change the folder. And here we have the rotation from 0 to 3. Now, you'll notice that this rotation is the identity matrix. That makes sense because we've set the three angles to be each of them 0. And if you remember from our the way we built the physical spherical wrist, we set up the 3 frame to be exactly equal to the 0 frame 
when all of the angles were zero. So the identity matrix is what we would expect to get here. Now I'm going to go back here and change theta 1 to 90. If you remember, that was our first test case that we looked at with our physical spherical wrist. So I'll run this and we'll take a look at our example. And you'll see here that our calculation in MATLAB does in fact match the calculation that we did by hand by looking at the actual spherical wrist. So that confirms that our code agrees with the physical device that we built. Let's do a couple of additional checks here. Let's do our second case where theta 2 is also 90 and run the code. And let's compare our result to what we got previously. So you can see that our MATLAB result here agrees with what we found by hand. So let's do one final check. Let's make theta 3 be 90, run the code, and check this one. And here we see that our R03 does agree with what we found before. So now the real power of having this code where we can do these calculations is that we can now do calculations that are more complicated than what we could figure out by just moving the spherical wrist around by hand. When we moved the spherical wrist around by hand, we made sure the angles were always 90 degrees, so it was easy to see what the rotation matrix was. Let's do a couple of calculations that are more complicated. Go back to theta 1 and let's change theta 1 to be 45 degrees. Make theta 2 be 0 and let's make theta 3 be 30 degrees. Now with these angles that are not exactly 90 degrees, it's hard for us to just move the wrist and see what the result would be. Let's run the code and see what the result is. Okay, so here we have the rotation matrix that results from these angles that are not nice 90 degree angles. This rotation matrix is telling us some important things about how the end effector is rotated. First of all, notice that in this third column, there's a one in the last element. This is telling us that the Z3 axis is in the same direction as the Z0 axis, even at these angles. You can see why this is. If you move your physical wrist into this position, Try moving theta 1 to about 45 degrees and theta 3 to about 30 while keeping theta 2 0. Can you see that this is true? That the Z3 axis is still in the same direction as the Z0 axis? Now, to help us understand the significance of the rotation matrix for our manipulator, we're going to make a change in how this thing is built. Start by taking your paperclip frame off the end of the manipulator. Now take off these pieces of tape that are labeling X, Y, and Z. Instead of using this paper clip as a coordinate frame, we're going to try and make it represent a gripper. So bend one of your frames back up so that you have a device that looks like what I'm holding here. It looks like a gripper, but one of the tines of the gripper is a long tine and one is a short tine. Then we're going to tape it back on to the end effector.
Now you're going to have to remember which direction is X, which is Y, and which is Z. So first of all, the direction that the tines are pointing in is the Z3 direction. The short tine is pointing in the direction of positive x, and the long tine is pointing in the direction of negative x. That together gives you the direction of y by using the right hand rule. So knowing that the tines are pointing in the z direction and that the short tine is in the positive x direction, you can get positive y. Once you have the coordinate frame replaced with the gripper. Go to Blackboard and look at the questions that are on Blackboard. The questions there are going to have you do a calculation with your MATLAB code and then interpret the result, the rotation matrix from 0 to 3, by using the gripper as a reference on your spherical wrist. Most of the questions in the quiz on Blackboard can be answered either by moving your physical spherical wrist around or by doing it mathematically. Try and do it both ways or at least make the association between what's happening mathematically in the rotation matrix and what's happening physically in your spherical wrist.